This video presentation begins our first steps in developing a molecular perspective. We are going to start with learning about the atom. Atoms are comprised of three subatomic particles called the proton, the neutron, and the electron. A scientist in the early 20th century named Ernest Rutherford proposed the nuclear theory of the atom based on his research. The two basic concepts of his theory are, one, there is a small, dense core in an atom called the nucleus. It contains the majority of an atom's mass and a positive charge. The proton and the neutron form the core of an atom and have approximately the same mass. The second concept is that the volume occupied by an atom is mostly empty space, containing negatively charged particles called electrons. The proton and electron are charged particles. The proton is positive and the electron is negative. They have a charge that is equal and opposite. And because of this, we can say the relative charge in atomic units is 1. A neutral atom has the same number of protons as electrons. This chart outlines some of the properties of subatomic particles. We can see from the chart that the mass of these particles is small. Using kilograms as a way to represent the mass of atoms is cumbersome. An accepted unit of measurement is the Unified Atomic Mass Unit, or U. It is defined as 1 12th the mass of a carbon atom, which contains 6 protons and 6 neutrons. Using this measurement, the mass of a proton and neutron is approximately 1 U. Atoms of the same type combine to form elements. A chemical symbol is assigned for each element and is usually a one or two letter abbreviation. The number of protons in the nucleus of an atom determines the atomic number. The atomic number is unique to all atoms for each element. This is important because it means it is the number of protons that defines the type of atom. The mass number of an atom is the sum of the number of neutrons and protons in the nucleus of an atom. The number of protons in an atom of any element does not change, but the number of neutrons can. Isotopes are atoms of an element that have a different number of neutrons. The isotopes of elements are distinguished by their mass number. For example, here are the isotopes of hydrogen. Each of them have one proton, but different numbers of neutrons. The isotopes of hydrogen are somewhat unique in that they have their own names. So, the isotope of hydrogen with one neutron and one proton is called deuterium, and the isotope with two neutrons and one proton is called tritium. Silicon has the chemical symbol Si and 14 protons. The stable isotopes of silicon have atomic mass numbers of 28, 29, and 30. So the three silicon isotopes must have 14, 15, and 16 neutrons respectively. Including the atomic number is redundant when representing isotopes. It is common to simply write the chemical symbol followed by the mass number. The atomic mass of an element on the periodic table is the weighted average of isotopic masses based on the natural abundance of each isotope. The natural abundance is the relative amount of each type of isotope found in a natural sample of any element. The natural abundance is relatively constant for each sample and unique to each element. A naturally occurring copper sample will have about 69% of the copper 63 isotope and about 31% of the copper 65 isotope. The atomic mass can be calculated using the following formula. This formula simply states that for any number n of isotopes of any element, the sum of the masses of isotopes multiplied by their respective fractions is equal to the atomic mass of that element. So, the atomic mass is calculated by adding up the masses of the various isotopes after multiplying each mass by its relative abundance. Now that we have an understanding of an atom and its dimensions, we can appreciate that counting individual atoms in an ordinarily sized object would be quite a challenge. Why do we need to count atoms? We will learn later that we often need to know the exact number of atoms available. The measurement used is the mole. The mole is a handy way to count atoms using their weight. 
A mole is equal to Avogadro's number, which is 6.022 times 10 to the power of 23. So, one mole of something is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the power of 23 units of that thing. You could have a mole of people, a mole of bricks, or a mole of sand. But in reality, using the mole to measure is only convenient for measuring atoms or molecules. A mole can relate those small particles to the size scale that we use and work with every day. How did the mole get its specific value, and how exactly do we use it to count atoms? Do you remember earlier when we discussed unified atomic mass units? Carbon was used as, as a standard. More specifically, a carbon atom with six protons and six neutrons, or the carbon-12 isotope. The mole is defined using the same standard, and one mole is equal to the number of atoms in exactly 12 grams of carbon-12. The mass of one mole of carbon atoms is 12 grams, which is numerically equivalent to its mass in unified atomic mass units. Since the masses of all elements are defined relative to carbon-12, Using it as a standard for the mole gives us a relationship between mass, number of atoms, and unified atomic mass. We call this relationship an element's molar mass, and molar mass is equal to the mass of one mole of any element. The units of molar mass are grams per mole, and molar mass is numerically equal to an element's atomic mass in unified atomic mass units. So how does this help us? we now have a powerful tool to count atoms. The periodic table organizes elements based on their chemical and physical properties. It is arranged in sequence according to an element's atomic number and lists useful information about each element. Elements fit into three broad categories, metals, metalloids, and nonmetals. Generally, metals are good conductors of heat and electricity. They will tend to lose electrons during a chemical reaction. Nonmetals are poor electrical and thermal conductors and gain electrons during a chemical reaction. The metalloids have properties of both metals and nonmetals. The periodic table can also be divided into main group elements, transition elements, and the lanthanides and actinides. The main group elements have properties that are predictable. Transition metals are elements that have unpredictable properties, and the lanthanides and actinides are elements that are placed separately for a more compact periodic table. They have similar properties to the elements lanthanum and actinum. Each column in the periodic table is called a group. Elements in each group have similar chemical and physical properties, and they are labeled with the numbers 1 through 18. Each row in the periodic table is called a period and is numbered 1 through 7. Elements in a group have similar properties. For example, the noble gases in group 18 are all relatively unreactive. We have already talked about an element being defined by its protons, and that isotopes of an element have a varying number of neutrons. But what about electrons? It turns out, atoms can lose or gain electrons. The general term for one or more atoms that has lost or gained an electron is an ion. More specifically, an atom that has gained an electron is called an anion and has a negative charge. An atom that has lost an electron is called a cation and has a positive charge. Main group ions will attain the same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas. Ions are represented by the chemical symbol of the element, with the charge of the ion noted as a superscript to the right. Metals will lose electrons to form a cation. Nonmetals will gain electrons to form an anion. Here are the main group ions and their typical charges listed on the periodic table. We have now covered the beginning concepts of an atom and atomic theory. You should be able to define the terms electron, neutron, proton, isotope, cation, and anion. Recognize that the atomic mass of an element is a weighted average and understand the formula to calculate atomic mass. You should now understand the meaning of the mole and Avogadro's number and be able to describe basic periodic trends. Following this video, it is important to work through the detailed examples and solutions provided in this section to apply your knowledge to calculations.